welcome. Welcome to this interview with, um, my name is Graham Goulden, and I'm doing this interview in conjunction with my POV, my point of view, the wonderful website that really shares some really powerful messages, some important conversations on really big topics. And this conversation today is going to be focusing on, again, active bystandership, peer intervention, with a specific focus on policing. You know, for many years, police critics have complained that officers who allow police misconduct to happen do more damage to communities' trust than sometimes the officers who commit it. Yet they have not really been the focus. And officers across the country have been told they must intervene, but they do not necessarily have been taught how to intervene. And the recent conviction of the three former Minneapolis police officers for failing to stop Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd in 2020 may not have been at the top of the news agenda here in the UK, but nonetheless, it's a story that brings back into the spotlight the consequences of police officers failing to intervene to stop harm. And we all know here in the UK, the murder of Sarah Everard in March 2021 by a police officer, Wayne Cousins, again brought to the surface the inaction of colleagues. And today it's a pleasure to be joined, in my view, by one of the world's leading scholars on active bystandership. Dr. Irvin Staub studied the roots of violence between groups after living through the horrors of Nazism and then communism in Hungary. And his best known book, The Roots of Evil, The Origins of Genocide and Other Group Violence, in which he explores the psychological, cultural and societal roots of group aggression. And after the Rodney King incident in 1991, Dr. Staub was invited to create a peer intervention training program for the LAPD with the goal of lowering the number and degree of uses of force. And then in 2014, he and other consultants assisted the New Orleans Police Department in developing EPIC, Ethical Policing is Courageous, designed to educate, empower, and support police officers to play a meaningful role in policing each other. And then latterly, Georgetown Law's um, Project ABLE, Active Bystander for Law Enforcement Peer Intervention Program, builds upon EPIC and starts to prepare fully officers to intervene to prevent harm and to really create a law enforcement culture that supports peer intervention. So, Irvin, welcome today and thank you for agreeing to speak to me. Listen, I'll say it from the start. I'm a bit of a self-confessed bystander geek. I really believe in the power of that active bystander, a person who I really can believe can make a difference in this world. So Irvin, welcome. Welcome to this conversation. I am pleased to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. And you're based just now in Florida, is that correct? You're yeah. At the moment in Florida, soon going back to Massachusetts. So enjoying the sunshine, sunshine state, I think they call that in Florida. Fantastic, fantastic. So the first question I really want to ask you, Irvin, today is, you know, I've followed you for the last few years, read some of your books. You know, one of, one of the, my favorite books is The Roots of Goodness and Resistance to Evil. It's well, well read in this house. Why did you commit yourself? You know, why did you commit your life to addressing violence with this specific focus on bystanders? Well, uh, the beginning of it is easy for me to understand and to talk about. And that is, as a young child in Hungary, I was six years old at the time when Hungary was invaded by Nazi Germany in 1944. Now, Hungary was a voluntary ally of Germany in the Second World War. But apparently, the Germans discovered that the Hungarian ruler was planning to have a separate place with the Allies once he realized that the war was being lost and they invaded Hungary. And what followed was gathering of Jews from the countryside and taking them to Auschwitz and then attacking Jews within Budapest and they were planning to have create the same fate for them. So there were two extremely important bystanders in my life. One was Rolf Wallenberg, a Swede who through various steps came to Hungary to try to save lives after the people from the countryside were already taken to Auschwitz and killed, uh, trying to save more Jews. And uh, he was amazing, very courageous, very inventive, 
created a so-called letter of protection that said that Hungarian Jews who have this letter of protection will be able to come to Sweden after the war and now they are under the protection of Sweden, which was a neutral country at that time. And uh, my mother and aunt succeeded in getting these letters and uh, we were moved into or moved into what was called a protected house that Wallenberg bought and was not very well protected. Constant raids on the house and people were taken away, but still many people survived in these houses. And the other person who I think had a greater impact on me was a woman who worked, a Christian woman who worked for my family. And uh, first, when things got really bad, she took my sister and me into hiding. My sister was just a baby. And then uh, when we moved into this so-called protective house, she prepared bread, took it to the bakery in a baby carriage, brought it back to feed us and other people in the house. The Hungarian Nazis stopped her once. She had to stand there for a long time with her arms against the wall. They told her they are going to kill her because she was helping Jews. And then a guy who knew her came in and said, let her go. And they did, and she immediately continued helping. And this woman remained part of my life. And these were powerful influences on me as time went on. But then, because of that, I begin to study. I escaped from Hungary. I came to the United States. I got a PhD at Stanford. I started to study at, teach at Harvard. And I began to study what leads people to help others. Yeah. What leads people to take action when other people are in need. Uh, and the concept of active bystandership applies to that situation. And I did this for many years. And then I also started to study what leads people to harm others, what leads groups to turn against other groups. And this is also relevant to active bystandership. And it's relevant to my own life because there is an evolution when individuals or groups begin to harm others, they change as a result of their own actions. If there are no countervailing influences, they justify what they are doing. They devalue the people they harm and they become more able and more likely to harm them again and to a greater extent. So that's also relevant to the police. But there is also a positive evolution. And I think that once I begin to study helping active bystandership and engaged in situations and engaged with people who were helpful, I was changing and I became more committed to that course of research. Yeah. And what, what do you think is one of the biggest motivators that allows people to help, that causes them to help others? <laughs> What's the biggest motivator for you in your research? I find that the biggest motivator is a feeling of responsibility for others' welfare. Yeah. It's even more of a motivator than empathy. Empathy means understanding another situation, feeling with another. But a feeling of responsibility for others' welfare is especially powerful. And that has two sources. One of them is internal. And in a series of studies, we found <clears throat> that people who have more of this feeling of responsibility, personal responsibility, are more likely to help. Okay. Uh, but circumstances can also focus responsibility on a person and make it more likely that they help. Um, we did a study with children young children in which they were sitting in a room working on a drawing and the adult before she left the room said there is another child doing 
the same work in another room, if there is any problem or issue, you take action to help. And when the adult said that, the children, when they heard sounds of distress from the other room, were more likely to get up and go into the other room. Or when the adult came back to report that. Uh, there is other research that also shows when circumstances focus responsibility on a person, that person is more likely to help. So I would say that that's a central element. And actually, that's one of the things that is likely to foster by our training on the part of police officers to make them feel that yeah. it's a responsibility for them to take action. And normally, when there are a number of people around, one of the things that can happen is that there is a diffusion of responsibility. People think, well, why, am I, why me? There are other people here who can take action and can help. Well, our training essentially tells them and try to engage with the idea that no matter what other people are doing, every one of you is responsible to take action. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, you know, I think the sense of responsibility is something that I'm really trying to develop in different settings that I work. So let's start to talk about policing. You know, you're one of the architects of active bystander and law enforcement. What's the basis for bringing active bystander programs into policing? Well, you know, I was invited to develop the original training or to develop a training that would address, address what happened in the Riot McKing incident. And in that incident, Rodney King, an African-American, was driving a car. A police officer tried to stop him. There was a chase that followed. And finally, a number of police cars were there. They pulled him out of his car. He was lying on the ground. Two or three officers were beating him with batons. And 17 officers were standing around watching and not doing anything. So. What's the basis for active bystandership? Well, the culture, the normal, traditional culture of police is that you support your fellow officer no matter what that fellow officer does. Yeah. So if that fellow officer drags somebody out of a car and is violent against that person, then whatever way it is necessary, you support that fellow officer. A core element of the training, which encourages police officers to be active bystanders who try to prevent or stop unnecessary harmful action by fellow officers is culture change. Yeah. That is to transform this belief that you support your fellow officer no matter what, and to promote the idea that what really benefits everybody, a citizen who won't be harmed, a police community relationship where the community won't step back from police because they see the police as violent and doing harm. Uh, the relationships among officers so that officers who don't like harmful, unnecessary harmful behavior uh, don't feel like they have to just shut up and tolerate it to transform this culture and get officers to see active bystandership to stop such as violence as positive work, positive collaboration with their fellow officers. Now, to bring about such culture change, it's a progressive matter and the whole many elements of the 
training that address a variety of issues are all promoting this. Uh, the way the ABLE training now is set up is that police has to make a commitment that they are going to seriously take and engage with this training and use this training. And there are something like 10 elements involved in this commitment. And one of them is that local organizations write in behalf of the police and say they are serious about this. Another element is that the top officers in a police department, the police leaders are trained first because without their support for the training, it is too costly for officers. It may be that they engage in active bystandership, stop some violence, and then they get punished. So the first people who are trained are the top leaders of a department. Another element is to discuss these issues with them. But then every other element of the training, for example, training in skills, how do you behave? How do you act? How do you practice active bystandership? And learning to start with minimal intervention, yeah. you know, you don't rush in like a bull in a china shop. You can just, as we found in New Orleans, it can be effective for an officer to just put his or her arm around the shoulder of an officer when that other officer seems to get heated. Yeah. And that can calm down that fellow officer and stop that officer from action. But also learning that if that is not enough, how to escalate intervention. And for this training, role playing is very important. So you role play how to do this kind of intervention, at least mildly. I mean, you can just, you know, put your arm around the shoulder of someone whom another officer seems to be about to unnecessary harm and walk away that person. So there are many ways of doing this and many ways then to escalate. Uh, so every element of the training, as I said, contributes to culture change. But there are, of course, also other elements of the training. Yeah. Everyone, you've, you've answered about four questions there. It's brilliant. You've really given me some really good good information you know this this idea of active bystandership you know you've talked about this idea of reducing harm lots of people i think misunderstand that phrase active bystandership and i often ask what does it mean to you how do you feel about that and you've answered that question it's the, it's about reducing harm harm to officers harm to communities and harm to um you know um, the organization of policing itself and i think it was really really powerful what you said there about the need for senior leaders, that top-down, but then we go to the bottom, the top-down, bottom-up approach. You know, and you know, for the next question, I can remember speaking to one of your colleagues and a friend of mine now, Joel Doskin, a few months ago, and he talked about pre, you know, before ABLE and EPIC, you know, police officers having only two options when they faced harmful behaviour. You know, option one was to do nothing and potentially to be investigated in the future. And option two was to report a colleague and be called that snitch, that grass, that rat. You know, what's the benefit of active bystander training for police officers themselves? Well, there are lots of benefits, but starting with the last one, uh, police officers hate to report on another officer, hate to be snitches. Well, if you prevent unnecessary harmful behavior, there is nothing to report. Yeah. Also, police officers can be, can they occasionally, often they get away with it, but occasionally they lose their jobs. Occasionally there is criminal prosecution of a police officer who engages in unnecessary harmful action. 
And uh, it's also the case that passive bystanderships, bystanders can also be prosecuted. Yeah. And more and more, in fact, that becomes likely. You know, it doesn't happen often as yet, but we saw it in the Chauvin case uh, that the passive bystanders there, or even an officer who very mildly tried to do something but then didn't pursue it, they can be prosecuted. And as I said, a very important part of this is that when police officers engages unnecessary harm, the community steps back. So they don't get the support that they would get otherwise in people who witness crime reporting what they have seen. They won't do that because they don't want to engage with this violent group, the police. So another benefit is more support from the community and just more better relationships with people in the community. When you walk down the street, there are friendly people who like you rather than unfriendly people who fear you and turn away from you. Mm. So there are a lot of benefits to the police and of course, a lot of benefits to the community and its members. Yeah. Um why do you think this builds community trust? Why do you think this type of work builds public confidence? What's, what's, what's going on? Why does it build public confidence? Yes. Well, for one thing, innocent members of the community are not harmed. Yeah. I mean, we know what powerful effect it has in people in the community when their neighbors or their people in their community whom they see as innocent is harmed by the police. In fact, that is one of the source when there are riots in a community against the police. That's one of the source of riots that people see the police doing unnecessary harm to members of the community. So it creates an outrage because also people feel personally endangered. If any innocent member of the community can be harmed, if a member of the community who stopped because of a broken taillight ends up being killed, that can happen to me and that can happen to anyone. So. This really, when that doesn't happen, and when there is positive intervention by fellow officers, that changes the whole climate of the community and police community relations. Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic answer. It all goes back to this idea of reducing <laughs> harm. And, you know, it's that common purpose to have safe communities. Um, you know, I'm coming, you know, I've got a couple of questions, a real couple of questions just to finish off with. And, you know, I've delivered the active bystander law enforcement program now for about a year, working, you know, you know, virtually with, with police departments across the United States. And within the training, we make use of your experiments, the Irvin Staub 1974 experiment, <laughs> you know, can you, you know, action breeds action. We also talk about the Milgram experiment from 1963. John Daly and Bib Latany, 1968, which looks at group group action, and Dan and, and John Daly again, and Daniel Batson looking at that being busy. You know, what? Why is it important that we look at the, these studies, and how are they relevant to policing? Well, uh, I mean, some of them are very directly relevant uh, because they show their power. I mean, my study shows how much influence an active bystander can exert. I mean, in, in that study, uh, two people sit in a room. Uh, they seem to be both participants in a study. They do the same thing, but one of them is actually an associate of mine. And there is a crash and sounds of distress from another room. And my associate says one of several different things in different 
conditions of the experiment. So with some people, they say nothing. Yeah. With some people, they say, that sounds bad. Maybe we should do something, but they remain passive. They remain sitting. With some people, they say, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's another experiment. I don't think it has anything to do with us. And with some people, they say, that sounds bad. Maybe we should do something. I will go and find the person in charge you go into the other room. And then that person leaves through the other door. So what happens? When the person says, maybe that's another study, a little under 25% of the time, the other person does engage in action, goes into the other room to check out the sounds of distress. When the person says, that sounds better, you should do something, but remains passive, doesn't do anything, about 50% of the time, the other person goes into the other room. When the person says, that sounds bad. I go find the experiment in chat. You go into the other room. 100% of the time, in every case, the other person goes yeah. into that journey room. So what does this show? What a bystander says and how that bystander defines the meaning of a situation can powerfully influence another person or other people, if other people are present. Uh, so the other studies are also all relevant in some way or another to understanding the underlying forces in a, a situation. Like in the Milgram studies, uh, people are told to raise on the level of shock every time another person makes a mistake on a test. And they do it, many of them, in the basic study, there are many variations on this, about 69% of the people go all the way, yeah. raising the shock level very high. Uh, even when at the end it says danger and various other things. Uh, but that's the focus usually. It should also be the focus that even in that situation, 31% refuses to go along. So these people basically, in a sense, are active bystanders they refuse to yield to the pressure of the experimenter who says, you do this. And we know a little bit about the characteristics of those people. Uh, actually, somebody, a famous psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg and one of his students studied in one of the studies, these people who would not go all the way. And they found Larry Kohlberg identified different moral orientations, and they found that the people who were most likely to stop administering shocks had what they called a responsibility orientation. Now, this is not exactly the same as the responsibility that I was talking about, but it is a relative of it. It's a responsibility orientation and not stop them from continuing. So each of these studies says something about the psychology of people who engage or do not engage or the circumstances that lead people to engage or do not engage in harmful behavior. Yeah, thank you. I, I loved how you went to the 31%. You know that I think Catherine Sanderson from... Massachusetts, he talks about moral rebels, the moral rebels in the world. And, you know, that takes us right back to the start of the interview when I asked that question about motivation, that sense of responsibility that, 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 that you discussed right at the start. What, what, what led to these individuals not pressing that um, triple X button? Listen, Irvin, I've had a wonderful experience, you know, speaking to you this afternoon. You've answered all my questions and more, actually, really loads of, loads of great information. And um, just thank you again for taking time 
out of your, your busy day, you're enjoying the sunshine, you're, you should be out there enjoying that sunshine. And, and thank you for the, you know, because another thing I think why evidence is important, because when I'm doing the training, you know, with Abel, this isn't just me speaking, it's the evidence, the evidence of you, Evan Staub, Stanley Milgram, John Daly, Daniel Batson, and other great academics. And this is about putting all this evidence into practice into practice which i really believe that we need to see more of and yeah listen Irvin, thank you for um speaking to me today it's been a pleasure to meet you um and that's one of my bucket list to speak to you my friend it's been fantastic i enjoyed speaking to you good luck with whatever you are doing all the things you are doing and uh, very nice meeting you yeah thank you again thank you again